This podcast is brought to you by ORC HSE Strategies, an industry leader in developing innovative, sustainable approaches for protecting workers and the environment. ORC HSE is known as an honest broker and a source of responsible business positions on EH&S legal and regulatory issues. Now, what ORC HSE does is they maintain a constructive working relationship with policymakers in industry, labor, government, and key professional associations. And they keep all members abreast of important legal developments and help them navigate the thorny technical, legal, and regulatory issues that are our lives in EH&S. If you're interested in learning more about the unique opportunities available through ORCHSE, please contact our friend Linda Haney at 202 510 0509. Or if you'd rather, drop her an email at lynda.haney at orchse.com. That's lynda, L I N D A, dot Haney, H A N E Y, at orchse.com. Now, let's go on to the podcast. We had an unusual call back about three years ago. Um, it was passed on to me from a business editor at the Times who said there was a guy at a branch in the San Fernando Valley section of Los Angeles um, who was saying that they had been rewarded for selling so many accounts, so many credit cards, providing so many services to people, and they had all done this uh, under a lot of pressure. And then some complaints cropped up, and the next thing you knew, they were firing people for doing the very same thing that they had praised them for. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Pre-Accident Podcast. Before we say one other word, listen to this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Stump, the Wells Fargo vision and values statement, which you frequently cite, says, quote, we believe in values live, not phrases memorized. If you want to find out how strong a company's ethics are, don't listen to what its people say. Watch what they do. So let's do that. Since this massive years-long scam came to light, you have said repeatedly, quote, I am accountable. But what have you actually done to hold yourself accountable? Have you resigned as CEO or chairman of Wells Fargo? The board, I serve at the... Have you resigned? No, I have not. All right. Have you returned one nickel of the millions of dollars that you were paid while this scam was going on? Well, first of all, this was by 1% of our people. I, and That's and, not my question. And, my question is about responsibility. Have you returned one nickel of the millions of dollars that you were paid while this scam was going on? The, the board will take care Have of that. Have you returned one nickel of the money you earned while this scam was going on? And, and the board will do I will it. take that as a no, then. Have you fired a single senior executive? And by that, I don't mean a regional manager or a branch manager. I'm asking about the people who actually led your community banking division or your compliance division. We've, we've made a change in our regional, to lead our regional bank. I just said, I'm not asking about regional managers. I'm not asking about branch managers. I'm asking if you have fired senior management, the people who actually led community banking division, who oversaw this fraud, or the compliance division that was in charge of making sure that the bank complied with the law. Carrie Toll said... Did you fire uh, no. any of those people? No. no. Okay. So you haven't resigned. You haven't returned a single nickel of your personal earnings. You haven't fired a single senior executive. Instead, evidently, your definition of accountable is to push the blame to your low-level employees who don't have the money for a fancy PR firm to defend themselves. It's gutless leadership. In your time as chairman and CEO, Wells has been famous for cross-selling, which is pushing existing customers to open more accounts. Cross-selling is one of the main reasons that Wells has become the most valuable bank in the world. Wells measures cross-selling by the number of different accounts a customer has with Wells. Other big banks average fewer than three accounts per customer, but you set the target at eight accounts. Every customer of Wells should have eight accounts 
with the bank. And that's not because you ran the numbers and found that the average customer needed eight banking accounts. It is because, quote, eight rhymes with great. This was your rationale right there in your 2010 annual report. Cross-selling isn't about helping customers get what they need. If it was, you wouldn't have to squeeze your employees so hard to make it happen. No, cross-selling is all about pumping up Wells' stock price, isn't it? No, cross-selling is shorthand for uh, deepening relationships. We only oh, do well. Let me stop you right there. You say no, no. Uh, I'm, Here I'm... are the transcripts of 12 quarterly earnings calls that you participated in from 2012 to 2014, the three full years in which we know this scam was going on. I'd like to submit them for the record, if I may, Mr. Chair. Thank you. These are calls where you personally made your pitch to investors and analysts about why Wells Fargo is a great investment. And in all 12 of these calls, you personally cited Wells Fargo's success at cross-selling retail accounts as one of the main reasons to buy more stock in the company. Let me read you a few quotes that you had. April 2012, quote, we grew our retail banking cross-sell ratio to a record 5.98 products per household. A year later, April 2013, quote, we achieved record retail banking cross-sell of 6.1 products per household. April 2014, quote, we achieved record retail banking cross-sell of 6.17 products per household. The ratio kept going up and up, and it didn't matter whether customers used those accounts or not. And guess what? Wall Street loved it. Here is just a sample of the reports from top analysts in those years, all recommending that people buy Wells Fargo stock in part because of the strong cross-sell numbers. And I'd like to submit them for the record. Without objections. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So when investors saw good cross-sell numbers, they did while this scam was going on. That was very good for you personally, wasn't it, Mr. Stumpf? Do you know how much money, how much value your stock holdings in Wells Fargo gained while this scam was underway? Well, first of all, it was not a scam. And cross-sell is a way of deepening relationships. When customers we've, use We've been customers, through this, Mr. Stumpf. I asked you a very simple it, question. It, Do you know how much the value of your stock went up while this scam was going on? It, it's all of my compensation is in our uh, uh, public Do filing. you know how much it was? It's all in the public filing. All, you're right. It is all in the public records because I looked it up. While this scam was going on, you personally held an average of 6.75 million shares of Wells stock. The share price during this time period went up by about $30, which comes out to more than $200 million in gains, all for you personally, and thanks in part to those cross-sell numbers that you talked about on every one of those calls. You know, Here's what really gets me about this, Mr. Stump. If one of your tellers took a handful of $20 bills out of the cash drawer, they'd probably be looking at criminal charges for theft. They could end up in prison. But you squeezed your employees to the breaking point so they would cheat customers and you could drive up the value of your stock and put hundreds of millions of dollars in your own pocket. And when it all blew up, you kept your job, you kept your multi-million dollar bonuses, and you went on television to blame thousands of $12 an hour employees who were just trying to meet cross-sell quotas that made you rich. This is about accountability. You should resign. You should give back the money that you took while this scam was going on, and you should be criminally investigated by both the Department of Justice and the Securities and Exchange Commission. You know, 
This just isn't right. A cashier who steals a handful of 20s is held accountable, but Wall Street executives who almost never hold themselves accountable, not now and not in 2008, when they crushed the worldwide economy. The only way that Wall Street will change is if executives face jail time when they preside over massive frauds. We need tough new laws to hold corporate executives personally accountable, and we need tough prosecutors who have the courage to go after people at the top. Until then, it will be business as usual. And at giant banks like Wells Fargo, that seems to mean cheating as many customers, investors, and employees as they possibly can. All right, now let's talk about this. Hi, everybody. You knew it was just a matter of time, and I'd let a little water go under the bridge. But we got to talk about this Wells Fargo thing. If we're going to talk about the new view and we're going to talk about systems reliability and we're going to talk about people and human error, then we got to talk about Wells Fargo. Now, I have no idea what your political underpinnings are. I don't know what you think, what you believe. I, I hardly concern myself with it, really. I don't even know what you think about Elizabeth Warren, and I'm sure there's a gamut of feelings about that. But she took those kids to school. And she took them to school not over the human operators. She took them to school over really the system in which the incentivized behavior was created. And she talked about accountability in an upward-moving fashion, and she did it pretty squarely. And special thanks to C-SPAN, because that's where I got that clip, and to CNBC. I've got a couple quotes in here from them. But I think we need to talk about the fact that this Wells Fargo thing was pretty crazy. And really, this has been going on since 2011. And what was happening is there was a high amount of motivation, a lot of production pressure on Wells Fargo's employees to open as many accounts as they possibly could to eat each individual banking client. And as you heard, their goal was eight separate accounts for each client. And they created a system where that's what they measured, and they measured it as many as four times a day in specific branches. So you were measured twice in the morning to see how many you sold and twice in the afternoon to see how, how many you sold. And when it all blew up, and it did blow up, I mean, there was a lot of blowing up to it, their response was to claim that they had fired 5,300 employees in relationship to inappropriate, non-rule-following behavior, and that the problem was solved. Now, here's what we know. <laughs> you can look at a problem in lots of different ways, but how you choose to see the problem is going to color what you fix. And if you get under some heat and your decision is to determine that our system is good, our bank is good, our people are bad, therefore let's remove the bad people from the system, then in theory, if that is in fact the solution, the problem should go away. So if we were really talking about deterrence, the first person they fired, let's make it a little more liberal than that, the first person they fired in each state should have in fact been sufficient to actually change the bad employee behavior and make the system good again. But we all know that's not the case. In fact, what we know for sure is that they bad apple the crap out of their people. And in their need to bad apple the crap out of their people, what happened is they put themselves as a business in a position where their systems were not only not reliable, but they also weren't just they weren't honest and just kind of as a matter of side, weren't legal. And when it blew up, it blew up big. And in fact, lots of people lost their jobs. Certainly the account has gone up from 5,300 to at least 5,301 because the senior executive, the very one you heard Elizabeth uh, uh, grilling, I guess is the word I would use, also eventually became a victim 
of that very, 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 very brittle system. Now, what's interesting is that their response to the to the world was in a memo that it sent to all their employees at Wells Fargo. When we make mistakes, we're open about it. We take responsibility and we take action. And their action was to terminate the bad employees. What's amazing about this case to us on the studying side of sort of systems is that this really is a very, very amplified example of what we deal with in our workplaces. A, a worker who, who, who uh, drops a hammer and gets three days leave without pay, right? A, a, a worker who, uh, who, who cuts his hand and has to go home. Uh, a contractor who wrecks a vehicle and is terminated. Now, that notion that somehow removing that bad person, that bad worker from the system, will make the system robust again is just, uh, well, it's the battle we fight. Because I will tell you, in my experience, and, and I'm really curious what your experience is as well, but in my experience, when we start looking first at the system, and then and only then, after we've looked at the system, we, we stretch out and look at the workers in the system. Our answer to why our system is brittle or why our system failed or why our system could fail is almost always found early in the system that we look at. In fact, I would suggest the Wells Fargo employees didn't cause Wells Fargo's CEO and chairman of the board to lose his job. The Wells Fargo employees really were uh, the sharp end of the stick, in this case the sales pressure stick, and they were pushed farthest into harm's way. And when it failed, they were the easiest, fastest, most convenient, and most politically expedient people to get rid of. The bottom line is, that's not what happened. And in fact, when you think about this Wells Fargo case, I want you to think about the fact that if they hired 5,301 bad employees, that really their problem was in employee selection, not in the way they do their work. But we know that's not the case. The story goes on. In fact, let me give you the final clip from a small little CNBC statement on this Wells Fargo disaster. They looked at this problem and they drove it really to a system solution, just as Elizabeth Warren really pushed it towards a system conversation. Listen to this small clip and we'll see what you think. The company said that, look, we police this. We know it's a problem. And when things get really bad, we'll fire the offending employees who violate our policies. And we will fire entire, you know, branches if we have to. And that's what you heard here. Um, whether that is an acceptable way to proceed, to wait till things get completely out of hand and then fire a bunch of people, or whether it would be a better idea uh, to make sure that these things don't happen, that you have some constraints in place that prevent this from happening. So how many times have you heard that very concept, those very phrases, in fact, those very words used around a conference table in your organization? We will enforce the workforce until they do the right thing. But in this case, they were enforcing. They were pressuring. They were actually working diligently to get the exact results they got. And when the system failed, the victims of the failure were the employees actually doing the work. There's a lesson in, in the Wells Fargo case for us. There, there's a pretty big lesson in the Wells Fargo case for us. And that is that when we take the approach that the worker is bad and that the only way we can get better behavior is by having better workers, then what we've missed are the countless complexities, the pressures, the context that the workers work within and oftentimes underneath that actually create the very environment we have. The lesson here is not about Wells Fargo or about Elizabeth Warren or the CEO or CNBC. No, the lesson here is that big companies and small companies everywhere fall prey to the, to the potential that the people are bad and the system is good. When in fact what we know 
in almost every case is it's not a matter of bad or good or right or wrong. It's a matter about weak systems and strong people, adaptive workers and brittle conditions. It's about the environment in which the work happens. This was really an interesting case. I, I hope when you heard it, you thought of it. I mean, I'm almost certain you did. It's gotten a lot of press, and it's out there, and you can look much deeper into this and really delve into sort of what exactly happened. How did we get to that point? How did they get to a place where that could happen? And the thing I think that's going to be interesting to watch is what did they learn and what will they change? Because if they learn nothing out of this, if we just get rid of people like crazy, which is what they did, then I would suggest we're in a system where this very event or something kind of like it could happen almost immediately again. Enforcement mine might notch up for a while. I mean, they're probably going to be much more attentive, but eventually that'll drift back down and normalize. Pressures will still continue because they're still a business. They still have to make money. But eventually, the big lesson here is will this make a difference? This is dramatic. People's lives were changed. But did they fix anything? That's the question. That's always the question. That's the podcast for today. Hope you enjoyed it. It's a pretty serious one, I know. Until then, learn something new every single day. Have as much fun as you possibly can. And for goodness sakes, be safe. <laughs>